Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome to another in a series of roundtable discussions on the Doctrine and Covenants. On this particular discussion, we'll be starting out with Section 129. Joining me for the discussion are distinguished professors from Brigham Young University. Our first is Dean Garrett. Nice to be with you. Oh, it's great to have you. Next to Dean is Randy Bott. It's good to be here, Susan. We also have Guy Dorius. Glad to be with you. Well, we're delighted that you're with us. If uh, you could join us as we now open to section 129 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This section was given six months after uh, the section on 128. On this particular day, Joseph Smith wrote, as we look at February 9th, 1843, spent most of the day in conversation with Parley P. Pratt and others. About the time that this revelation was received, a man had come to Joseph Smith and told him that he'd seen an angel and even described his dress. Joseph said to the man that he was mistaken and that in heaven there was no such dress. The man was furious and commanded fire to come down from heaven to consume the prophet and even his house. Well, with that kind of uh, as a beginning, and now maybe Randy, uh, to carry it on, a, more of an overview look at what we're going to learn about angels and what Joseph has to tell us. Well, uh, sections 129, 130, and 131 are listed as instructions. Uh, the prophet Joseph had gleaned just a, an absolute library of material that, that hadn't necessarily been given uh, in revelation form or format but uh, but he realized that his time on earth was becoming rather short and, and uh, he wanted to make sure that the saints uh, were armed against the things that they would be f uh, facing between there and the second coming. Uh, last time in section 128 in verse 20, he alluded to the fact that uh, in verse 20 that uh, the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna River, River uh, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. And it seems like that here he's saying, oh, uh, I'm not sure that I've adequately prepared uh, the saints to uh, be able to detect uh, Satan when he comes. If it took uh, Michael, the archangel, in order to help Joseph the prophet to uh, detect him, then he realized that we may be outclassed without a little bit more information. Good, great. Uh, Dean, tell us what we're learning about angels as we start off here in verse 1. And well, I, I think the way that he's using the word angel here is different than we than is normally used in, 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 in the church. We talk about angels as any heavenly visitor that comes, as an angel comes from God. But in this instance, it's more specific than that. Angels are resurrected beings who have bodies of flesh and bones. And I think it, find it also interesting in, in, that he, that he, Joseph teaches a very strong, a very strong testimony of, of the Savior's resurrection and the fact it was a physical resurrection of flesh and bones as he, as he teaches this principle for, you, you, for handle me and see for spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. So an angel in, in used in this scripture, in, in this section, is much more narrow in definition than what we normally use, the word yeah. angel. Thank you. What about this just men and uh, I, all of that? I, I think Andy? sometimes uh, that throws people a little bit. They'll say, who is, who is a spirit of a just man made perfect? Uh, these are people who uh, have died in the faith, uh, are, uh, are, are putting the final touches on their perfection in the spirit world and awaiting the resurrection. And so they are just men who have now been made perfect but yet are not resurrected but will be resurrected and likely become celestial beings. Good. It uh, then goes on to talk a lot about hands and grand keys. Uh. There seems to be something to that being able to touch or the, 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 the ability to... Uh, as, as Dean said, if an angel is that resurrected being, this section instructs, though it be a resurrected, perfected body, uh, you can touch it, you feel it. And, uh, 
and there seems to be an acknowledgement of that as a test to be able to know. And, uh, and he's also instructed if you have one of these just men made perfect who's disembodied, that they won't, they won't even attempt because uh, we'll learn in the next section about spirit matter, we aren't refined to a point that we could fill that. So there's a, there's a test, three grand keys, whatever those keys are, uh, it has something to do with recognition of visitors who may bring you things, revelation or whatever else. So. Good. Dean, anything to add on that? Well, I think an example of that would be when Peter and James came and laid hands upon, along with John, and laid hands upon the head of Joseph Smith. They laid hands upon his head as resurrected being, same with John the Baptist. But uh, I'm sure the prophet maybe had visit, had opportunity to have others come who are not uh, resurrected beings, and they would not lay hands. They would not touch in that it process. It appears as somebody who has something that needs that physical, tangible touch, yes. an ordination or a bestowal of keys needs to have that they body, and that others body. may just have a message, but you need to be able to distinguish between those and, and those who might deceive. Now, Satan, with his great wisdom, and <laughs> in quotation marks, but his, his desire to deceive and to lead astray, he will appear as if he is a resurrected being. He will appear if he's an angel of light. And the prophet here is given a, a way to to make sure you can identify who he is. For some reason, if you offer Satan or one of his spirits, uh, his your hand, he will he will attempt to to uh, shake hands with you because he wants to be as if he is an angel in this definition, as a resurrected being. He wants to deceive but you to that point. Is. You won't feel yeah. anything. Yeah. Uh, but I'd like to add to what uh, what uh, Dean said here. It, it, th these are just some of the keys that yeah. are there. Uh, the Prophet Joseph, in, uh, as recorded in the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith on page 214, said that the, a, a person or a visit a visitor coming from Satan would have sandy colored hair. In the words of Joseph Smith on page 20, uh, he says uh, that either he will reach forth to shake your hand or he will draw back, but he will not stand still. And so there are additional keys that the, that, that the prophet Joseph Smith gave that are not included here, but evidently he felt like these were at least sufficient to help uh, someone who is really tuned in to detect a person, I don't think this was given just because one isolated person sometime in the history of the church would be visited by a, 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 an adversarial messenger, that this was going to be a relatively frequent thing uh, that we all needed to know about. Good, thank you, I appreciate your insights. We now move on to section 130. Uh, it's two months later, the prophet Joseph is in a little town called Ramus. Uh, it's a Latter-day Saint town for the most part. It's 22 miles southeast of Nauvoo. And on April 2nd, the day this is given, uh, Joseph has attended a meeting in which he's heard Orson Hyde preach. Um, as uh, Orson has preached about the Savior, he talks about uh, when we see him, he's going to come on a horse as a warrior and that God is a warrior and God's in our hearts. Uh, after, after the talk, there was a dinner at Sophronia McCleary's and Joseph uh, said to Orson, wanted to know, uh, would, would you mind if I, I made a few corrections to your speech? Uh, I'm impressed with Orson. He says, uh, they shall be thankfully received. And uh, the corrections then we now find in section 130 and uh, afterwards Joseph will in an afternoon meeting give them publicly. As we start off, um, a guy, maybe start off, a uh, great example insights. What, what do you pick up from well, this section? Well, this section's an example, and I think, I think Randy alluded to it just previously, that, that Joseph had learned a lot of things uh, along the way and early on, but now he's starting to divulge them to the saints. And so this becomes almost like a, if I can use the term, a casserole of doctrines. It, it's, he's, he's bringing in things that he knows that the saints may be confused about, and, and it, it appears as though, from some of the things William Clayton's uh, scribing of this event uh, or remembrance is, is that verse 14 almost appears to be the first verse. Uh, because if you, if you follow a, a line of thinking, verse 14 says, I was once praying very earnestly to know the time of the coming of the Son of Man. And, and, he, and he speculates about uh, an idea that, that uh, if he, he said he once heard a voice repeat the following, if, if thou art livest until thou art 85 years old, thou shalt see the face of the Son of Man, therefore let this suffice and trouble me no more. And then this, 
prophet almost almost answers himself. He says, I was left thus without being able to decide whether this coming referred to the beginning of the millennium or some previous appearance or whether I should die and thus see his face. And then he says, I don't believe it's going to be any sooner. He kind of stays, but then it shifts to verse one, when the Savior comes. And that's the doctrine he really wants to get out. It, it, it's not this, sometimes we get caught up in the speculative nature of 85 years. And, and he's, he's really wishy-washy about that. He said, I don't know what that means, but when he comes, and then the sure doctrine starts to come, I think. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, as we read then, verse 1, when the Savior shall appear, we shall see him as he is. We shall see him that he is a man like unto us. By verse uh, 2, it's talking about uh, social things. Tell us about that, Dean. Well, it's kind of interesting that he's talking to us about, you know, we, we, all of us are, uh, most all of us are concerned about what's going to be like when we leave this life and go to the next phase of world. And he says to us very simply that the same sociality we have here, which exists among us, will exist among us there. Only it will be completed with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. And I think we can see that. I think you can see as we look at how families form today and how the relationship with families are, are developed in our lives and how, they, how are they important they come. You, you take that and extend that into eternity, as President uh, Hubie Brown said, that the eternity is nothing more than the extension of the family into eternity. And uh, so when, uh, that's, I think, is an important statement that we're here, that we, can, we have a pretty good idea what type of sociality is going to be there because we're enjoying it now as we look at our families and associations we have here. Good. I agree on that. Uh, Randy, we move on to celestial fears, and we're back to angels, and now even Urim and Thummim. Randy gets all the angels. Uh, it seems like I get all the heavy duty stuff here. Uh, I think it's really interesting in verse 4, he, uh, in answer to the question, is not the reckoning of God's time, angel's time, prophet's time, and man's time according to the planet on which they reside? And he answers yes, but it's interesting that uh, he segregates uh, the time that as it's counted on the world where God lives, one and the world where angels live, but he also segregates the difference between prophet's time and man's time. Uh, and then he said, uh, uh, look, uh, that there is so much that we don't understand, but there's some wonderful things ahead that, that, that this earth in its celestialized state is going to be like uh, a globe of sea of glass and fire and if you want to know anything about the celestial, terrestrial, or celestial kingdoms, you can look down into the earth and everything for your glory is manifest there, past, present, and future. And so even though that, that could lead us off into speculative areas that we probably need to stay away from for lack of time, boy, some fruit, some wonderful thought uh, as you contemplate the, the necessity of making are, are getting an inheritance on such a globe so we would have access to that information. By, by verse 12, he's uh, talking once again about this war that we know is a civil war. Uh, Guy, do you want to add something to that? Well, it's just once again, e even still early, some critics say, well, uh, it was obvious there were conflicts beginning of things, but still the s specifics of, of Joseph Smith is pretty amazing uh, that 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 the bloodshed previous to the coming of the Son of Man will be uh, in South Carolina. The difficulties will begin there. That's kind of very specific. And it does take us back to Section 87, the revelation on war, mm -hmm. that the beginning of the bloodsheds, the Civil War seems to be a marking point of the beginning of the end as far as blood, bloodshed and warfare and things like that. And we see that in our modern world today. Not a day goes by that we don't read of some skirmish somewhere, some death, some some uh, some anger uh, that that so this and he says it probably arise through the slave question and you're a historian Susan and you know there were other issues but right. that issue some people tried to dismiss it but it was a major issue it, of the civil war issue. so very much so Good. very much so we we've mentioned just briefly on this uh, Joseph Smith in 85 uh, years and the coming of the son of man maybe add a little something to that Randy well i i think uh, uh, sometimes uh, we really get hung up and say, okay, he was born in 1805, and 85 would be 1890, and therefore it didn't happen in 1890, therefore he's a false prophet, 
And yet, what, what he's really saying here is that the Lord says, no, I'm not even going to reveal to you, my chosen prophet, head of this dispensation, exactly when I'm coming back again. That's vouchsafed in my bosom and the bosom of the Father. And that, uh, that your major responsibility is to use every single day to the best of your advantage and keep from being deceived and being led astray. And when I come, I'll come and you'll know it. <laughs> and, and it almost appears Joseph's more casual on this point than he is. He, he, oh, yeah. he states doctrine soundly throughout the doctrine. He comes on this one, he says, I'm not, I'm not sure what it meant. He, does, he, he really, really backs away from this well, one. Well, not only that, the Lord says in verse 15 where he says, well, or 85 years of old, if I live long enough to be 85 years of age, and the Lord knows all things and knows whether he's going to or not. And then at the end of that, he says, let this suffice and trouble me no more on this matter. He's saying, look, <laughs> just don't bug me anymore. Don't worry that. about it. If you live that long, you'll understand. If you don't live that long, you'll understand. So don't worry about it. Okay, good point. And as we move along to verse 18, about the principle of intelligence that we attain to in this life. Uh, Randy? Well, here we go again. Uh, you we know, all sometimes need this. Uh, <laughs> what are we talking about? This here? Uh, uh, principle of intelligence, sometimes we think, oh, I better get a college degree or I'd, uh, I'd better learn as much as I can, which is all helpful because of Section 88. But, uh, but what he's really saying is that the principle of intelligence not the amount of intelligence is what's going to help us. Now, back in section 93, he said the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. And you can tell when you've got light and truth because light and truth forsake of the evil one. So whatever principle we can identify that will help us uh, identify and overcome the, the uh, temptations of the adversary will give us so much the advantage in the world to come. And if, if through our diligence we learn more of the keys and learn more of how to detect and overcome the influences that Satan makes into our lives, we'll have so much the advantage in the world to come over those who are unaware of the fact that many of the philosophies and the ideals that we, the ideas that we have and traditions we have really are satanically uh, based. Okay, great, great comment. And now we come to... Uh all blessings are predicated upon obedience. Okay, Guy, what does that mean for us? Well, I, I think it even ties to what Randy was just saying, yeah. intelligence or knowledge of what? Uh, once it, it said earlier that man cannot be saved in ignorance. Well, well, ignorance to what? And that, that's ignorance to the principles of salvation and, and the ordinances of the gospel. And here, the, the Lord is repeating basically what he teaches in section 88 through the prophet Joseph. There is a law, and when we receive any blessing, when we obtain any blessing from God, it's by obedience to law. And uh, Section 88 teaches us that, in fact, uh, salvation comes through obedience to law. And, and sometimes we don't like that concept because we all disobey once in a while. But the idea that law uh, preserves us and, and sanctifies us, uh, that those are concepts that were taught earlier. And I think Joseph's just reiterating them uh, in this confusion of, of some false doctrine. I think he's just saying... There is a law, and we need to obey it. Good. Dean, want to add? Well, and I think also the, the principle here that's important for us and as we go through the day-to-day -day life is the principle of obedience. Uh, he has his laws, and if we're going to receive the benefit of the law, that comes because we obey. And if we, if, if we disobey, we take ourselves off from underneath that law, and we can't have the benefit of that law. But if, So if we really want what he has to offer to us, then the way that we get that is through, dis, is through obedience to him. And if we will obey and have the spirit of obedience, not just the lockstep obedience, but really develop within our heart that real desire to do whatever he would ask us to do, then we will get what he wants us to have. And eventually what that is, is exaltation. I'd, I'd like to just capitalize on what they're saying. It's so important. The adversary's plan in the pre-earth life was that there should be no consequences. You could do anything you want and there was no cause and effect relationship. And here, and again reiterated in section 132 and verse 5, the Lord says, no, there is a law. When you pick up the one end of the stick, the other one comes. Now that has, it has implications in both positive and negative. If, if you pick up the law upon which attaining the celestial kingdom is predicated, you'll get the celestial kingdom. If you don't, then it's rather childish for us to believe that we can receive a blessing without obedience to that law. Okay, then, then we learn of those who have always been obedient to the law. We're back to verse 22. Uh, Dean, the 
the Father, a great, great promise that we now learn more truths. Yeah, he, he restates here, and I, and I emphasize the statement he restates here, that the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man, and the Son also, the Holy Ghost, has not a body of flesh and bones. Um, there are some people today who suggest that this is the first time Joseph really put in writing, and this is therefore the first time he really knew that the Father and Son had a body of flesh and bones. But if you study him carefully and study what he taught and so on, he knew from the very f time when he saw the Father and the Son in the grove until until this time that God was that they were two separate beings with bodies and flesh and bones. In this instance, he's restating it in context of the of the historical background of of or, or of the of of the preaching of that you know God could dwell in their heart and would dwell in our heart, he's correcting that and saying, no, that's not how it's going to be. The Father does have a body of flesh and bones as tangible as ours. The Son also has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as ours. But the Spirit is not um, the, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has a spirit, and therefore it functions differently than, than one who has a body of flesh and bones. And in verse 23, a man may receive the Holy Ghost, and it may descend upon him, but not tarry with him. To really have the, the companionship of the Holy Ghost takes baptism and takes confirmation to be eligible for that companionship. Thank you, and thank you all for your great insights on section 130. We now turn to section 131. Uh, notice it's six weeks later. Joseph is back in this town, about 20 miles now from Nauvoo. And notice it's given on two different days. Uh, we can divide it, verse 1 through 4, uh, May 16th, and then the remaining verses, May 17th. Uh, maybe a little background on the May 16th. In that evening, he's speaking with Brother and Sister Johnson about the priesthood. And then he turns to William Clayton, and then comes verses 1 through 4. Uh, Randy, do you want to talk about this celestial marriage? Well, I'd like to just say that uh, the Lord does what he has always done and what he said he would do in section 98, line upon line and precept upon precept. In section 76, he taught about the great celestial kingdom and who would go there. And now he subdivides or fine tunes, refines his teachings saying, in the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees. And, and in order to obtain the highest of those, a man must enter into an order of the priesthood. And that order of the priesthood is the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he doesn't, then it isn't because God doesn't want to get him there, uh, because that's his work and his glory to give us ex exaltation. It's because we then choose not to embrace the law upon which that's pr as predicated. And unless we go there as couples, then we have no possibility of uh, continuing to have eternal increase. Good. I think it's also important in those verses to, to kind of point out that this is where we learn that there are three degree, three different levels in the celestial kingdom. We know the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, but now now he's indicating there are three different levels in that kingdom too. Good diet. Well, also the, the idea in, in verse four that we almost we get our kind of our definition, which which maybe for us is pretty redundant, but the definition of exaltation is eternal increase or becoming as our Father is. And as Randy said, that's only in partners through this order of the priesthood that we enter into, this patriarchal order of the priesthood that we enter into as couples, as husband and wife. Uh, uh, and and uh, notably, uh, the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, uh, Joseph at this point is, is capping off the restoration of the new and everlasting covenant in, in total. We have, we have section 22 calling baptism the new and everlasting covenant. Now we have marriage way down the, the road uh, being that. Okay. Great insights. We now move to May 17th. Uh, Joseph is still in Ramus. About 10 o'clock that morning, he's preached uh, using as his text uh, Second Peter, the first chapter, and he's talking about knowledge is power, and the man has the most knowledge, has the greatest power, but then all of a sudden, then comes beginning section 5. Uh, as we move into this, uh, Dean, do you want to talk about men being sealed up to eternal life? Well, it's it, as you look at verse 5 and verse 6, uh, the more short of prophecy, he gives us a definition, a meaning here that, that I think is important for us to have one's call and election made sure. Maybe it could also be used with this same type of definition. It's man, and it's interesting here, a man knows, knowing 
that he sealed up. It's not a speculation type thing. You have your, the more short of prophecy is a man knowing that he is sealed up into eternal life, into exaltation, by two means. One by revelation uh, and, and the other is the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. We have a tendency to take verse 6 out of context. We will talk about verse 6 in, in context of the of um, education, but really it deals with knowing that you have been sealed up to your exaltation. You cannot be saved in ignorance of that. Great. That's a wonderful place to end our discussion. Uh, thank you for the wonderful insights, wisdom that you've shared this hour. We've learned this hour. Uh, information that will help us more as we study section 129 through section 131. Thank you very much. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.